Hey guys, and welcome back to the Finance Now podcast. This podcast is purely for informational and educational purposes, and it's my way of sharing my knowledge, research, and opinions with you. I'm Anurag Brilla, and some big things went on in the markets this week. You know, I wanted to start with the big macro picture, kind of what everyone was waiting for. All the investors were kind of looking forward to this meeting in the minutes from this FOMC meeting. And essentially what we got from it was that rates are likely going to be higher for longer. Jay Powell is clearly in no rush to cut the rates, and why should he be? I mean, there was clear indication from him that, you know, March cuts are unlikely. And markets came tumbling 300 points after that. I'm not so su- I'm not so sure why, to be honest. I don't really get why the markets were so surprised by that, because if you take a look at the, the unemployment data, it's just not bad enough for them to be cutting rates so soon. I mean, clearly what they're everything that's happening right now it's it's sort of working they're aiming for this soft landing unemployment is not brutally being affected and inflation is coming down it's not come down to the point of two percent which is where powell wants it but it is coming down and you know by some looks it may seem like unemployment is getting worse um, you know, we're hearing about a lot of tech layoffs, but overall, the amount of jobs being added back in other sectors as well is is quite high. So while it may appear to be getting worse, that's just through a very specific lens. But, you know, before people start panicking about, you know, the soft landing not being not being able to occur, I think people need to understand that nothing's wrong at the moment for Powell to be changing the interest rate cuts and he's trying to beat down inflation the end goal is obviously to get to two percent and you know clearly right now the Fed doesn't have confidence in in the fact that inflation is completely um, completely under control so he wants to see more progress I mean we're currently sitting at around a 3.3 3.4 percent of inflation and it's still a way to go to that two percent target and you know when we say a soft landing that's definitely growing in possibility uh the fed just needs to steer us into that two percent without the unemployment and without the job market taking too much of a hit and perhaps avoiding that recession altogether now with the big macro there were a lot of other things that happened i want to go back a week you know earlier than this week i want to go back and just start talking about chips and the semiconductor space because two companies reported earnings a week and a half ago two weeks ago intel and asml and i know amd reported earlier this week but there were a few interesting trends that kind of popped up in in the semiconductor space and i want to start by talking about asml You know, ASML, uh, they make the machines that are used to manufacture some of the most complex chips in the world. Um, That's essentially what they do. They're a European company, and they had an amazing quarter. They beat both top and bottom line estimates. Their net sales were came in at 7.2 billion euros versus the expected consensus of 6.9 billion euros and their net profit was 2.05 billion euros versus an expected 1.86 billion euros they showed a 12.5 percent year-over-year growth in their fourth quarter sales with a gross margin of 51.4 percent overall pretty healthy look um they they look like they're they're doing very well as a business let alone the stock price i mean just operationally they look like they're doing incredibly well and 2023 as a whole for them was was a good year they had a 30 percent increase in year-over-year revenue growth but the reason i i mentioned you know a trend that popped up the reason for for that trend was essentially a lot of the chip companies seem to be saying that the outlook for 2024 was rather bleak in comparison now revenue is expected to be around the same for 2024 as it was in 2023 but one thing i found interesting that the ceo peter wenning said was that 2024 is an incredibly important year in preparing for significant growth that is expected in 2025 now this makes sense given the macroeconomic pressures the the markets are facing and the US economy and global economy are facing you know the situation we're in this coming year there's a lot of uncertainty around um, interest rates around inflation around growth and the expectation is that 
this hopefully doesn't trickle into 2025. And by this, I mean the uncertainty. You know, I think people by the end of this year should have an idea of where inflation is at the moment, what they can expect with rate cuts a bit better than they do at this current moment. Now, you know, I mentioned ASML is a European company. It's a Dutch company. And amidst this global tech battle, this global semiconductor battle between U.S. and China, ASML kind of finds itself in the middle. Now, the Dutch government imposed some restrictions on the export of certain advanced semiconductor and chipmaking tools to China. And this was due to, you know, a lot of pressure from the U.S. government. And ASML had previously said that this would impact between 10 to 15 percent of their China sales, which, according to their CFO Dassin, is is likely to be the same for 2024. Looking back at at the year ASML had, China was their largest market last year. So these steps are very obviously politically driven and preventative for one country to attain a lot more data and processing power than the other. I mean. Overall, this this does end up trickling down into the wider semiconductor um, space and a lot of American companies that are reliant on China sales. This obviously is, they obviously end up being collateral damage in this political battle. But, you know, amidst this, I think ASML is such a great stock to own. It surged 24% over the last month or so. It's It's quite highly valued at the moment, an expensive stock, but it's... It's a company that's so vital, you know, honestly, in my opinion, one of the most important companies in the world, because without them, um, the entire value chain of the semiconductor manufacturing is is affected. Now, I want to move on to, to another company that announced earnings uh, the week before, and that's Intel. Intel, you know, they actually had a good previous quarter with both revenue and earnings results exceeding analyst expectations. But the reason the strop, the stock dropped more than 10% was was because of, once again, that trend that I was talking about, the 2024 outlook. So the outlook is not great. You know, they, they predicted an adjusted earnings per share of $0.13 cents a share versus the expected $0.33 cents a share. And the revenue outlook was $12.2 billion versus uh no, between, sorry, 12.2 and 13.2 billion versus what was expected to be 14.15 billion. So it is significantly lower than what the analysts had expected. But there are some positives to take away from Intel. You know, the core business, which is their PC and server chips business, you know, according to Pat Gelsinger, their CEO, remains very healthy. But their sales are forecasted to take a hit because of weakness in, you know, some of their other subsidiary businesses. Mobileye was one of them. That's their autonomous driving technology um, and advanced driver assistance systems. That That's their subsidiary there and also the programmable chips unit, which is another subsidiary of theirs that they spun out sometime last year. Now, their previous quarter showed some solid growth, a 10% sales growth, which is the first time actually in seven quarters that they have broken the declining revenue streak. And, you know, much like all other semiconductor companies or majority of the semiconductor companies, Intel's stock price has surged over the last year. Clearly not as much as the likes of NVIDIA and AMD, but it's it's gone up 75%. Intel, to me, is incredibly interesting. Is The reason I, I like this company is because they're looking to build out their manufacturing capabilities in order to compete with what TSMC are doing in terms of offering that those manufacturing services to other companies. And they're in a very transformative stage at the moment. You know, at the end of the day, they are the largest chip company in terms of revenue, but they significantly lag in, in terms of market cap, which is, is very telling for, for how the business has performed. Now, what excites me about their manufacturing capabilities going forward is that the Biden administration has announced chip subsidies that to $53 billion worth, and Intel is a beneficiary in that list. So in efforts to bring back manufacturing amidst this global chip battle, in efforts to bring manufacturing to the U.S., you know, companies like Intel and TSMC are obviously going to be given uh, sub- subsidies to help set up their their manufacturing businesses 
out, out there in the U.S. And while Intel's foundry services business remains a small part, it remains pretty nascent at the moment, if they can build, build it out, you know, to be one of the leading manufacturers of chips, as a company, Intel are, are going to be an absolute powerhouse. You know, Gelsinger has a plan, and Intel are making progress for sure. And it just begs the question to me in my head, you know, I wonder if this could be a good growth story because of the amount of different streams and areas of the chip manufacturing value chain that Intel have their hands in. So it is an exciting company for me. It's one I'm going to be looking out for this year, especially. And, you know, we'll see how they do if if they can, you know, if they can surprise on even their outlook for 2024. I think things could be good for them going forward. Lastly, the last chip company I want to talk about um, is AMD. Earnings was a huge surprise, wasn't, sorry, a huge surprise as such. You know, everyone kind of expected AMD to do well. The stock had a run up prior to earnings as well. But, you know, again, that theme of 2024 outlook being a bit bleaker than anticipated followed. So AMD stock actually took a hit after earnings. And AMD is one of those companies where it's tricky, right? There's so much growth priced into this company. It's highly, highly valued. And they're directly competing with the world's darling child at the moment, and that's NVIDIA. But the main takeaway from for me from this call was the recently launched Instinct MI300 series, which, which are GPUs for data centers, essentially. And that's the space that NVIDIA have dominated and have been showing accelerated growth in. You know, there's a huge addressable market in the data center AI accelerator space, and that's proven by guidance for the 2024 data center GPU sales being raised by 75%, despite a wider slowdown in global chip sales that, you know, everyone's outlook has been affected by. My my opinions on NVIDIA versus AMD, though, are are very different. I... I mean, I own shares of AMD and I do not own shares of NVIDIA, which which obviously it does upset me at times, but NVIDIA, in my opinion, seem to be the leaders in this space. They're the innovators. And, you know, AMD are kind of lagging, but they're always playing catch up and they are always eat into some market share for sure. They're a well-run business. But the true innovation and the true growth and the true, I I guess, forecasting into the future comes from NVIDIA. And, you know, both these companies are very, very highly valued. And I I wonder if there will be a correction at some point and hopefully a moment for me to an opportunity for me to to get into NVIDIA as well as add to my AMD position as well. Now. You know, just to briefly, briefly wrap things up, how can I go through this week without talking about big tech? There were several big tech earnings, and I don't want to go through all the companies, but there were two standouts, in my opinion, and that was Amazon and obviously, as everyone can expect, Meta. So Amazon Q4 earnings were were pretty incredible. They beat analyst expectations as well as provided some positive outlook for the the coming months. The stock was up about 7%, maybe a little above 7%. And the main driver here for for the Q4 was was holiday sales and better than expected holiday sales. You know, to everyone's surprise, it was a record-breaking holiday season. Now this includes obviously Black Friday, Cyber Monday, um, Christmas, Thanksgiving, and you know with amazon it's one of those companies that's so widespread that i like to use amazon as some sort of indicator for consumer strength it 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 always helps me gauge you know how much the consumer is spending whether inflation is affecting consumer behavior too much and whether that's slowing down and clearly um the main driver here being the growth in in uh record breaking holiday season sales shows that they're not that affected you know revenue came in at 169.9 billion versus an expected 166.2 adjusted eps was a dollar versus the expected 0.78 dollars and aws aws which is what everyone you know labels as amazon's growth engine came in at 24.2 billion versus the expected 24.22 billion 
advertising which was a big surprise to everyone that came in at 14.7 billion versus what was expected to be 14.2 billion and this is something that's interesting to me because while everyone looks at AWS as the main growth engine you know I obviously agree and I think AWS is is one of the most important segments of Amazon as I mentioned earlier this is a business that's so widespread into consumer into entertainment and Actually, you know, along with AWS, I, I want to talk about how integral I think their entertainment, Prime Video, and MGM businesses, their subscription services, Twitch, and streaming, and gaming is to Amazon. Because clearly their advertising is, is growing and doing better than expected. And ad revenue fits into these businesses very, very well. We can see that with Netflix. And if if Amazon Prime Video are able to leverage, you know, their services and their subscription platforms and streaming platforms into incorporating a lot more ads and making it a lot more monetizable, ad revenue is going to play a huge role in their growth. And we saw this with Meta as well throughout the years. You know, Amazon also talked about their new shopping assistant, Rufus, their Gen AI tool that, you know, is hopefully going to make shopping experience of customers better and more curated to the individual. You know, they've cut a lot of jobs, become more operationally efficient, if I may say, a bit more lean as a business. And they cut a lot of jobs at Prime Video, at Twitch, which as sad as it is, it's it's probably a good thing for the future as, as we will see you know, in Meta's earnings, how the job cuts kind of affected them in a positive way. And they're, Amazon are innovating. There are a lot of Gen AI developments happening. They're increasing their capital expenditure, and that increase is expected in 2024. It follows that trend that Google and Microsoft have also set. You know, everyone's sort of increasing capital expenditure in their AI and cloud businesses. So it makes sense to cut costs elsewhere and, and lean out the, the organization as a whole. Now, lastly, Meta, this is by far the story of the week. In fact, honestly, the story of the month, story of earnings, shares were up 20% on the Friday. The markets absolutely loved what they saw. Revenue for Meta grew 25% in Q4 from a year earlier. That's the fastest rate of growth for any period year over year since 2021. And even better, their net income more than tripled year over year. One-upping that. The company's sales forecast for the coming quarter well exceeded analyst expectations, with it forecasted to be between 34.5 and 37 billion versus what was expected to be 33.8 billion. Now, you know, these these are obviously great bits of news. Their earnings was incredible, but there's even more. Now, Meta has promised to pay its first ever quarterly dividend, as well as authorized a $50 billion share buyback plan. This is by far the largest news that investors could have heard. I mean, this is huge. Zuckerberg is showing that returning capital to investors is a big consideration for him. And he's showing that Meta as a business are able and mature enough to do that. Now, the cash dividend is going to be 50 cents a share paid every quarter, obviously subject to market conditions. But, you know, this this Meta story is an incredible turnaround since their struggles of 2022. And, you know, Zuckerberg was talking about 2023 being the year of efficiency well we've we've seen the results here and you know the year of efficiency is quite literally paid dividends for him reality labs and the metaverse and all that cash burn for some reason now seem a thing of the past no one's talking about it even though it's still there and you know leaning out the business the job cuts have clearly worked their transition meta's transition to focus on ai you know their llama large language model and how that is hopefully going to yield results to advertisers is is a huge move they're moving away from this metaverse play and focusing on ai and you know that's showing that zuckerberg's adapt he, he's showing his adaptability and clearly the market thinks highly of of zuckerberg and this company and in my opinion too meta has got a very very bright future both in advertising in and also in in their general wider platform offerings as well as ai and i think they're they're a dark horse in this ai race and they definitely have a lot of use cases for it and they definitely have a lot of data to leverage um, a lot of their technology and hopefully become a much much more 
crucial business to the entire AI value chain. Now, I, you know, that kind of wraps up the earnings I want wanted to talk about. But I will say overall, stocks have been having a great run great run not just not just the start of this year but in general last year markets have been very optimistic you know there are a lot of companies at incredibly high valuations and there seems to be a lot of optimism around the various interest rate cuts and the rate of the cuts and that makes me very very wary of what would happen given interest rates don't get cut till the second half of the year or even close to the second half of the year you know i'm i'm not too sure a lot of these valuations are are justifiable they're very hefty and in my opinion i do see a correction coming at some point in time i would hope it comes sooner rather than later but you know it it really depends on on what the expectation is with the market and and what the reality is when when the fed get together and announce their decisions on that note if you did make it this far in the episode i thank you for listening once again i'm honor of brilla and this is the finance not podcast Good time.